Basic Principles of Tranquility Meditation Passages in the Tipitaka describing particular ways of practice use rather fixed terminology. Even though these passages appear in different locations, there are two main outlines for the way of practice in which tranquility precedes insight, and they both involve reaching a superior level of concentration before developing insight. This, this can be called the supreme way of practice. The following examples of these two main outlines are drawn from passages recording the Buddha's awakening. Outline number one. This common description describes the four jhanas followed by threefold knowledge, vidya. So to Agi We Sana, when I had eaten solid food and regained my strength, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, upakalesa, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imper Probability, I directed it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. This was the first true knowledge attained by me in the first watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, I directed it to knowledge of the passing away. This was the second true knowledge attained by me in the second watch of the night. Ignorance was banished, light arose. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, I directed it to knowledge of the destruction of the tents. I directly knew as it actually is, this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, this is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. These are the tents, this is the origin of the tents, this is the cessation of the tents. This is the way leading to the cessation of the tents. When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of becoming, and from the taint of ignorance. When it was liberated, there came the knowledge. It is liberated. I directly knew birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming into any state of being. This was the third true knowledge attained by me in the third watch of the night. Ignorance was banished, light arose. When this description is used to describe the practice of realization for disciples of the Buddha, the terminology is <coughs> the same except for the passages in brackets. Some passages describe <coughs> direct kinds of knowledge rather than just the fragments in the book, while other passages only mention directing the mind to the final knowledge of destruction of the tents. Outline number two, a less common description describes the eight concentrative attainments, samapati, in addition to the attainment of cessation, niroda samapati followed by the knowledge of the destruction of the tents. So to Ananda, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered and dwelled in the first jhana. But as I was dwelling in this state, mental application accompanied by perception, sanyamana sikara, associated with sensuality, disturbed my mind. 
which was for me an impediment at Ba'da. Then it occurred to me, with the subsiding of applied and sustained thought, let me enter and dwell in the second jhana. Then on a later occasion I entered and dwelled in the second jhana, but as I dwelled in this state, mental application accompanied by perception associated with applied thought disturbed my mind, which was for me an impediment. Then it occurred to me, let me enter and dwell in the third jhana. Then on a later occasion I entered and dwelled in the third jhana, but as I dwelled in this state, mental application accompanied by perception associated with rapture disturbed my mind, which was for me an impediment. Then it occurred to me, let me enter and dwell in the fourth jhana. Then on a later occasion I entered and dwelled in the fourth jhana, but as I dwelled in this state, mental application accompanied by perception associated with Equanimity disturbed my mind, which was for me an impediment. Then it occurred to me, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, let me enter and dwell in the base of infinite space. Then on a later occasion, I entered and dwelled in the base of infinite space. But as I dwell in this state, mental application accompanied by perception associated with physical form disturbed my mind, which was for me an impediment. Then it occurred to me, with the complete surmounting of the base of infinite space, let me enter and dwell in the base of infinite consciousness. Then on a later occasion I entered and dwelled in the base of infinite consciousness, but as I dwelled in this state, Mental application accompanied by perception associated with the base of infinite space disturbed my mind, which was for me an impediment. Then it occurred to me, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, let me enter and dwell in the base of nothingness. Then on a later occasion I entered and dwelled in the base of nothingness. But as I dwelled in this state, mental application accompanied by perception associated with the base of infinite consciousness disturbed my mind, which was for me an impediment. Then it occurred to me, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, let me enter and dwell in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Then on a later occasion I entered and dwelled in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. But as I dwelled in this state, mental application accompanied by perception associated with the base of nothingness disturbed my mind, which was for me an impediment. Then it occurred to me, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, let me attain the extinction of perception and feeling. Then on a later occasion, having seen the danger in the base of neither perception nor non-perception, I attained the extinction of perception and feeling, and by seeing with wisdom the tents were completely destroyed. So long Ananda as I did not attain and, mer and emerge from these nine gradual abidings, in both direct and reverse order, I did not claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its devas, Mara and Brahma in this generation with its ascetics and Brahmins, devas and human beings. But when I came and emerged from these nine gradual abidings in both direct and reverse order, and I claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its devils and humans. The knowledge and vision arose in me, unshakable is my liberation of mind. This is my last birth. Now there is no more renewed existence. When this second outline of the gradual path to enlightenment is used in a general sense for disciples, they both it follows the same terminology but without the detailed analysis.
<coughs> when that monk abandons these five hindrances, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, fourth jhana, the base of infinite space, the base of infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness, the base of neither perception nor non-perception, he enters and abides in the extinction of perception and feeling, and having seen with wisdom, his taints are utterly destroyed. <coughs> the reason for selecting two passages describing the Buddha's enlightenment as examples for the two outlines of practice is to show how these two ways of practice are essentially the same, despite appearing different. They both describe the enlightenment of a single Buddha, and this enlightenment occurred only once. Scholars may be confused by or misunderstand these two outlines of practice by interpreting each description too literally and overlooking evidence from other sources that reveal their compatibility. There are five main misunderstandings about these two outlines of practice. 1. The belief that it is necessary to attain the first two kinds of knowledge, recollection of past lives and recollection of the passing away and rebirth of beings, before one is able to reach awakening. Two. The belief that the fourth fine material jhana is an adequate basis for reaching the threefold knowledge of Vijja and the six kinds of higher psychic attainments of Binya. 3. The belief that it is possible to reach enlightenment while abiding in the extinction of perception and feeling. 4. The belief that these two outlines indicate two distinct ways of practice to awakening. Five, the belief that the gradual attainments described in these outlines occur in a single period of time. Let us look more closely at these misunderstandings. One, evidence that is not necessary to attain the recollection of past lives or the knowledge of the passing away and rebirth of beings in order to attain arahantship. I realise Nibbana is clear. A. In some examples of the first on outline, there is no mention of the first two kinds of knowledge. A person attains the fourth jhana and directs the concentrated mind directly to the destruction of the taints. These examples show that the two former kinds of knowledge are optional. B. In the Susima Sutta, the Buddha describes arahants liberated by wisdom, Panyavi Muta, who are not attached to the five aggregates and discern dependent origination, and yet are unable to perform psychic powers. They do not have the divine ear, telepathy, recollection of past lives, the divine eye, Kuku Papati, pa, Kuku Papati, Ta'iyana, nor do they dwell in peaceful deliverances. Santabi Moka equals formless attainments. They only possess the knowledge of the destruction of the tents. They do not possess the five mundane kinds of supreme knowledge, Abhinya, nor have they accessed the formless jhanas. See. <coughs> The attainment of the six abhinya, including the three vijja, depends on a certain degree of refined concentration. With sufficient concentration, a person is able to direct the mind to generate a desired kind of abhinya. It is not necessary to attain one kind of supreme knowledge before attaining another. That concentration has attained to full tranquility and achieved mental unification. Then to whatever mental state realizable by direct knowledge. Abhinya Satchi Karatniya Dhamma 
He directs his mind. He achieves the capacity of realizing that state by direct knowledge whenever the necessary conditions obtain. If he wishes, may I wield the various kinds of psychic power? May I hear both kinds of sounds, the divine and the human? May I understand the minds of other beings? May I recollect my manifold past lives? May I see beings passing away and being reborn? May I in this very life enter and dwell in the taintless liberation of mind? He achieves the capacity of realizing that state by direct knowledge whenever the necessary conditions obtain. The required level of concentration to reach these attainments is as follows. 2. The concentration samadhi of the fourth jhana is the highest form of concentration. Even the concentration of the formless jhanas is classified as the concentration of the fourth jhana. Since the mental factors of the formless jhanas consist of the same two factors of the fourth jhana, equanimity, upeka, and one-pointedness, ekagata, the concentration of the fourth jhana is universally applicable. It can be used, for example, as a basis for insight, for supreme knowledge, abhinya, or for the attainment of extinction. There is, however, a special clause. The concentration of the formless jhanas is more refined, and further from adverse conditions, pachanikadamma, than the concentration of the fourth jhana. Even the different formless jhanas become progressively more refined. It is for this reason that those who attain arahantship are, after attaining the fourth jhana, classified as liberated by wisdom, Panyavimuta, not as liberated in both ways, Ubato Pagavimuta. To be classified as liberated in both ways, one must have previously attained one of the foremost jhanas, therefore there is a proviso to the commentario statement that the fourth jhana is used as a basis for other attainments. In some cases, the concentration of ordinary fourth jhana is used, while in other cases, the more refined concentration of fourth jhana of the formless jhanas is required. As mentioned earlier, literally speaking, persons liberated by wisdom, Panyavimuta, have only attained the knowledge of the destruction of the tents. They have not attained other forms of knowledge, Vija or Abhinya, nor have they attained the formless jhanas. Attainment of the three Vija or the six Abhinya is the domain of one liberated in both ways, Ubato Bhaga Vimuta, who has also attained the formless jhana. This is the standard definition as found in the Pali Canon. The commentaries offer a more elaborate definition, which can be summarized as follows. At first, a person practices tranquility meditation until attaining the fourth jhana. This is followed by the attainment of all eight jhanas. These attainments, however, must be a result of practicing the eight kasina meditations, excluding the meditations on light and space. Having gained fluency in the eight attainments, the mind becomes receptive. At this point, the person only needs to enter the fourth jhana and then directs the mind to generate or apply one of the abhinya according to his wishes. As preparation, a person must access the eight attainments, but at the time of achieving a supreme attainment, abhinya, accessing the fourth jhana is sufficient. Due to the previous cultivation of the eight jhanas, a person's concentration in this case will be more refined than the concentration of someone who has never attained a level of a level higher than the fourth jhana. 
From the angle of this commentarial explanation, one can say that the fourth jhana is a basis for supreme knowledge of binya. This conforms to the statement that the mind possessing eight factors by developing the concentration of the fourth jhana to the degree of the formless attainment is suitable for application. It is a basis or approximate cause, padatana for realizing any state that may be realized by direct knowledge. Exceptions to this rule are those who have a strong previous connection to by yoga, those who have made effort and accumulated virtue in the past, for instance the Buddha, the silent Buddhas, Pacheka Buddha and the chief disciples. They need not follow this procedure and become proficient in the formless jhanas. They simply need to be skilled in the fourth jhana to achieve abhinya. Two passages above describing the Buddha's awakening are compatible with this interpretation, even if they do not mention a previous connection. In the first passage, the Buddha accesses the fourth jhana and then directs the mind to realize the three vijja. Earlier in his life, he had established a strong foundation in samatha and attained the eight jhanas while living with teachers, Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramaputta. The second passage reveals that the Buddha developed proficiency in all levels of concentrative absorptions before his enlightenment. 3. Passages describing the extinction of perception and feeling, Sanya Veda Yita Niroda, can easily lead to lead inexperienced readers to the false conclusion that the person who has attained this state reaches our hardship while abiding in this attainment. By completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, he enters and abides in the extinction of perception and feeling, and having seen with wisdom, his taints are completely destroyed. This passage lists the sequence of practice <coughs> and realization, does not, but does not include the circumstances or intermediate details. The the reader should see this list of stages not as the description of a single event. Compare it with a passage from the Pali Canon that provides more detail. By completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a monk enters and abides in the extinction of perception and feeling. When a monk both attains on to and emerges from that attainment, his mind becomes subtle and pliant. And with his mind subtle and pliant, immeasurable concentration has been well developed by him. With this immeasurable concentration that is well developed, he directs his mind to whatever mental state is realizable by direct knowledge and he attains the ability to witness these states whenever the necessary conditions obtain. If he wishes, may I wield the various kinds of psychic power. May I hear both kinds of sounds, the divine and the human. May I in this very life enter and dwell in the taintless liberation of mind. He achieves the capacity of realizing that state by direct knowledge whenever the necessary conditions obtain. In the second passage, the entering upon the extinction of perception and feeling and the destruction of the tents are separated. The attainment of Sanya Veda Yitani Roda is a supportive condition restoring a suitable level of concentration to the mind. Afterwards, by seeing with wisdom, a person dwells in the taintless liberation of mind. These passages corroborate the fact that the two earlier outlines for the way of practice in which tranquility precedes insight 
have essentially the same meaning for as can be seen from the previous three points, addressing various misunderstandings, the two main outlines describe a single way of practice from different angles. The first outline emphasizes the practice and highest realization that results from applying well-developed concentration to accomplish supreme knowledge and insight. Second outline describes intermediary stages of tranquility meditation along with the true purpose of tranquility, the final stage of insight. In this sense, the previous three points have already addressed the misunderstanding that the two formulas describe two distinct ways of practice. 5. Points 2 and 3 have already touched upon the subject of time in reference to practice and realization. In the first outline, the Buddha's gradual attainment of the three widgets occurs in the three watches of a single night. But in the case of all of other practitioners, the attainment of widya or each abhinya can happen either in quick succession or separated by months or years. Second outline describing the Buddha's concentrative attainments clearly indicates that a period of time elapses between each attainment. Examples of the same outline describing the attainment of other practitioners, however, do not mention time, which can give the impression that these attainments occur during a single time period. The fact there is no uniform period of time that these attainments occur, it will vary from person to person. The two outlines merely describe the different levels of attainment. They do not necessarily define the time involved. There are passages in the scriptures that confirm this fact. For example, the story of Venerable Sariputta in the Digana Ka Sutta, while the Buddha was giving a discourse on feeling Vedana and other topics in the Boar's Cave on Mount Vulture Peak, to the wanderer Digana Ka Sariputta was standing behind the Buddha, fanning him. Reflecting on this Dhamma teaching, Sariputta realized that a hunchship. This occurred after Sariputta had been ordained for two weeks. Looking at the Sutta in isolation, one may have the impression that Sariputta had not reached any attainments to add to his opening of the Eye of Dhamma stream entry two weeks previous to this occasion. Instead, at this moment, he realized realized complete awakening or a hardship. But by reading the Anupada Sutta one sees that during these two weeks Sariputta was developing insight in conjunction with Janas, Yu Gana Da Ha Samatabi Pasana, tranquility and insight in unison without interruption. From the first jhana to the extinction of perception and feeling. This reveals that he had realized the fruit of non-returning before listening to the Digana Ka Sutta. One last question that should be addressed is can arahants develop tranquility meditation and increase concentrative attainments or psychic powers after being enlightened? Those who use insight as a vehicle, Vipassana Yanika, have not previously attained jhana, but at the moment of path realization, concentration becomes firm and they access the first jhana. Afterwards, they can access the first jhana, fruit of attainment, Parasamapati, in order to abide in happiness in the present whenever they wish. 
The question here is whether they can develop higher levels of jhana. The sub commentaries claim they can. Their state of mind is conducive to refining and strengthening concentration. They probably develop samatha to promote a happy abiding in the present, Dhitarama Sukha Vihara. The same most likely holds true in regard to supernormal powers, Abhinya, for two reasons. However, Arahants do not spend a lot of effort trying to attain new powers. First, they do not seek special psychic powers for their own advantage, and second, the benefits to others are not enough to warrant the difficulty and time required to develop them, as described in the Vishuddhimaga. Arahants are more likely to use the time and effort to teach others, <coughs> which is called the miracle of teaching Anu Sa Sani Pati Hariya. In which the Buddha praised as the greatest of all miracles. <coughs> this is superior to concerning oneself with mundane psychic powers, which are potentially harmful and lead ordinary people to be fascinated in a mysterious and obscure world that lies beyond their ability to understand and causes them to neglect more important activities. Normally, people seek protection in external conditions or divine powers, which opposes fundamental Buddhist principles. Arahants who do not wield mundane psychic powers still possess what the Buddha called a noble power, Arya Edi. They are able to look at unendearing repulsive people and things as endearing and not repulsive. Similarly, they can see attractive, alluring people and things as impermanent, conditioned and unworthy of attachment. This is a great power. <coughs> this is a greater power than walking on water, diving into the ground or flying through the air, which the Buddha said are not noble carry risks and do not lead to liberation. These mundane psychic powers are not the essence of Buddhism and they are not an indication of a person's value. One can find evidence of these powers before the time of the Buddha and in other traditions. They are only considered excellent when applied by one who is pure and fully awakened. For ordinary people, they can be as dangerous as they are helpful. A fully awakened person, or even someone attained to a lesser stage of awakening, who has moral conduct and perfect right view, samaditi, is superior to someone possessing the five mundane powers, but devoid of these virtues. Most of the Buddha's Arahant disciples are liberated by wisdom, Panyavi Muta, without elevating to higher levels of concentrative attainment, and even many of the disciples liberated both ways. Ubato Bhargavi Muta did not generate the five mundane powers. <coughs> 